Thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, my name is Brendan Park. I am from Grace Community Church, which is a sister church to home church in that we are part of the RCA denomination as well. In Grace Community, I'm one of the deacons there, and I'm also part of our speaking team, and I also lead our young adults ministry. But in my day-to-day -day life, uh, you might actually be surprised to know about this, I'm not a Bible student or anything like that. I actually work as a paramedic, which creates for a very unique perspective on life and spiritual matters. Because when people come up to me for prayer asking, hey, I've got you know, such and such sickness, can you please pray for me? Sometimes I'm like, okay, yes, I can definitely pray for you. And other times, because of my background, I'm like, okay, yes, you really need prayer. In fact, let's do it on the way to the hospital. <laughs> Hop in the car. <laughs> and also as one last little point as well, because I know somebody's probably tempted to ask, though everyone's too gracious not to, but I'll just settle the matter right now. No, I'm not 16. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many people ask me if I'm still in high school, even though I'm working on an ambulance. <laughs> or ask, oh, is it bring your kid to work day? <laughs> which also makes my work partner feel really good, because then it's implied that they're my dad, which uh, also goes over really well. I'm actually 25, if anyone can believe it. So it's funny this week, I was talking to Pastor Jim regarding this morning, you're talking about surprises that take place during the week. My surprise happened on Tuesday night when I got the phone call saying, hey, Brandon, so at home church this upcoming Sunday, can you please speak? Sure, why not? But he also told me, after I told him all about this morning's message and everything, he informed me that uh, today is International Women's Day. So for everyone here who is a member of the female gender, happy International <laughs> Women's Day. Men, I'm sure your day will come at some point too. So before we begin, I just want to open us up in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for being here with us this morning. And we just pray, Lord Jesus, that you be with us, that you open our hearts, Lord, and as we look into your word, may you please be with us and help us to receive your word. And above all, we just ask that your name be glorified this morning. So a while ago, I heard a story courtesy of historian Bill Callahan, a historian with the Tower of London, about King Henry VIII of England, who reigned on the English throne from 1509 to 1547. He was, as I'm sure some of you may know, famous for having six wives, though thankfully not all at the same time. That would have been just ever so awkward. This story takes place just after the death of Jane Seymour, Henry's third wife, who died after giving birth to their son. In case you're wondering, his first wife was divorced and the second wife was executed. When Henry's wife, Jane, died, this left King Henry as a single father with five children and no wife despite three marriages. Not an ideal situation if you're the king of England, or any man for that matter. Now in the modern times, a man in that situation might have resorted to the internet or other means of trying to find a new spouse. King Henry did something similar. He commissioned his royal painter, Hans Holbein, to go around Europe painting portraits of beautiful young women in hopes of finding one that he fell in love with in order to find the next queen. This is actually one of the first recorded instances of online dating. <laughs> Except in the 16th century, there was no internet. Eventually, Holbein painted a portrait of a young German princess named Anne of Claver. Henry saw her portrait and fell in love. In fact, he fell in love with her so much that the two were legally married before she'd even arrived on English shores. They were actually already three weeks into the marriage by the time she arrived in England to meet her new husband, Henry VIII. I'm sure you can all see the potential for a disaster building with this method of finding one's true love, and that is exactly what happened. Anne arrived at the Tower of London, where Henry was waiting to meet her with a reception. The artist Holbein, on the other hand, disappeared. You see, there was a small problem. 
Holbein was an artist. And as you may know, artists have a tendency to see things we can't. He had painted inner beauty. But when Henry VIII saw her for the first time, historians report his face fell and remarked, my goodness, she looks like a horse. <laughs> Clearly, that marriage was off to a fantastic start. The two were later divorced, and Henry moved on to wife number five. To sum up this story, and I'm um, hoping and praying that this works, I'd like to direct your attention to the screen. Oh, yes, it does. Sweet. Where we have a picture of a man looking into a mirror. Actually, there's two images. Okay. One that Pastor Jim provided me, which is the lady on the right side, and then the man looking in the mirror. What happened was I gave my PowerPoint, and it was home churchified. Now... Mirrors are designed to reflect the image of whatever is standing in front of them. In this case, the mirror should be reflecting a complete image of the man in the way that he appears exactly, much like the image next to it. However, you will see that the image in the mirror for the man is not what is standing in front of it, which then begs the question, which of these is the true image of the person? Is it what the mirror reflects? Is it what we see, or is there something more to it? Now, despite the fact that this image in the mirror is reflecting something that is totally not what is standing in front of it, in case, uh, in case you can't see, that the man has effectively been turned into a monster by his mirror reflection, some people have a tendency to believe that is the true image. Now, how is that possible, you ask? Well, you showed up to the right place this morning, because that is exactly what we're going to talk about this morning. Mirrors can be a weird one, but did you know that they only reflect outer beauty? In other words, what you see is what you get. Mirrors, though, are incapable of grading your outer beauty or telling you whether you're beautiful or not. That's actually up to us. Some people look in the mirror and are immediately horrified with what they see. We call it a bad hair day. Others look in the mirror and admire what they see. True story. We had a case at work when I worked in retail security a few years ago where we had a store employee who was in our staff coat room. Normally, you just go in, put your jacket on, and leave. But in one case, one of our warehouse staff decided he wanted to change his T-shirt, something you normally don't do in a coat room that's open to both genders. However, in this process, he saw himself in the mirror thought he looked rather handsome, and proceeded to check himself out in the mirror in different muscular poses for a couple of minutes. Now, you may be wondering, how do I know this? There was one small issue. He had neglected to notice that there was a camera in the coat room designed to prevent internal theft. While he's standing in front of this mirror having a jolly old time, two of us are in the security office watching this on the monitor, and believe me, we were horrified. <laughs> and later was he when we went in and told him this. The point I want to make is this. Mirrors focus on outer beauty. What you see in the mirror is your own outer beauty, and that appears to be open to your own interpretation. The mirror, though, just gives you an image. It doesn't tell you whether the image is beautiful or not, which is what we as people tend to focus on. However, there's actually this whole other beauty that we don't often think about, and that is what I want to focus on this morning. Everyone else saw Queen Anne in her outer beauty, but Holbein saw her in her inner beauty. And as we're going to see, the inner beauty is actually way more beautiful than the outside. You see, in a way, God is an artist. He created us. Artists create their own world when they paint. It's what artist Bob Ross says in The Joy of Painting. He says that when he creates an image, he's essentially creating his own world. So when God creates something, he can see it in its full, entire inner beauty. But what does that look like? What do we look like when God sees us with his own eyes? 
Now, we're going to try to go in depth with this because I don't exactly want this to be the generic, you're all beautiful, so nothing to worry about speech. Because as I have experienced in life, just because someone says it might not necessarily be enough. We need depth and we need scripture. It's funny that every time I hear someone preach, God loves you, you're beautiful, don't worry about anything, you'll have the best life ever, my life doesn't get any better. We do need to go a little deeper than that in order for that to actually happen. So let's start with our first point with talking what inner beauty is. What is it? Simply put, it's the beauty within us that God sees. Believe it or not, the image of you that God sees when he looks down on you isn't necessarily what you see. I remember a while ago when I made a remark after I thought somebody was acting a little weird, and I said, well, they may be acting like a weirdo, but I suppose God still loves them. But the person with me at the time asked, but do they appear weird to God? Which got me thinking. See, I thought they were acting a little weird. Still do. But God doesn't think like that. He can see deeper in them than I can. What he sees is their inner beauty, which in his eyes is not weird at all. In fact, it's awesome. I think of the story of God selecting King David. Now, David, I'm sure we'll all agree, was a great king. It's evident how much God values him, and he was probably one of the best kings in the history of Israel. Now, he wasn't perfect. He made a few mistakes along the way. Who hasn't? That's life. He also made that one giant mistake with Bathsheba, and then he had that real doozy over the whole census thing that got 70,000 men killed by God. But God still saw David in his inner beauty. Let's now look to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, I should warn you, in order to fully explore the concept of inner beauty, we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture. So if you are looking at all of this in your Bible, I apologize for all the page flipping that you might be doing. All right, let's read 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 and 7, which read, and this is Samuel when he is at the, the, um, Jesse's house trying to find the new king. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I personally have every belief that God knew everything that David would do in the future, including the bad stuff, if he picked him. He knew if he picked David, this stuff would happen. But God isn't focused on outward appearance. He looks inside. The heart is part of your inner beauty. What you should know is that back in the time of Samuel and David, kings were generally looked upon for their physical attributes. How they appeared to society is actually what decided whether or not they were a king. But God himself clearly admits in this passage that he can see something we can't. Inner beauty. He can see in our hearts. That's how I know that the inner beauty is what God sees. Because he did it for David, we can know that God can do it for us. And that's our first point for this morning. So we've talked about what inner beauty is and how God sees it, but we still want to know what does inner beauty look like. What does it look like in God's eyes? Well, the answer for this question is going to require an in-depth look at Scripture, because even though the Bible doesn't have a verse that says, inner beauty is this, and looks like this, and acts like this, it does leave a few clues that, when put together, can help us see what this beauty is. So let's look at Genesis 1. Yes, the answer to this question requires us to start in the first chapter of the entire Bible and go from there. It's one of the first things that God put together in all of creation. So we're going to go cover to cover to discover this, and with any luck, we'll be done by midnight. 
I'm joking. <laughs> At this place in the Bible, in Genesis 1, God has just finished creating the entire world. He hasn't created man yet, but he has just made the whole world and everything in it. But now he's at the point where he has pronounced everything good and decides to create mankind. So let's look at Genesis 1.26, where we're going to discover our, first, our second clue about inner beauty. Here's the hint. It's on page 1. Genesis 1.26 reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And then in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What's interesting to note about verse 27 is that looking through the different English translations to the Bible, the English Standard Version, which is supposed to be one of the most word-for-word translations available, says the exact same thing as the New International says in this verse. In the New Living Translation, the only change that they make to this verse is that the word man becomes human beings. And then the Message Translation says this. It reads, God spoke. Let us make human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature. And then skipping further down, God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. This is the second point I want you to take home this morning. God created man in his image. In fact, when you read us in these passages, it means created in the likeness of the Trinity. Remember, Jesus himself is with God. He didn't just randomly show up in the gospel. He's already present in heaven when the world's created. Now, man was not created to be God or to have God's power, but man was created in God's image, in his likeness. Now, despite the fall of Adam and Eve, I can't find anything in the Bible that says this image did not travel down through mankind. What this means is that your inner beauty, what God sees when he looks at you, has the image of God in it. Every single person throughout all of history has been their own unique person with their own unique appearance and their own unique personality. We are all no different. There is a piece of God's image in you. You are created in God's likeness. Now, because of the existence of sin, that is quite often hard to see from our perspective. But that's the start of your inner beauty. Your inner beauty has the image and the likeness of God in it. What does God see when, you, when he sees you? Probably not what you see in the mirror, especially if you're having a bad hair day. But when God looked at Adam and Eve, he saw his own image and likeness. And I cannot find any biblical reason for why that doesn't exist for any of us. And the fact that every person who has ever walked on the face of the earth has been distinct in their own unique way can also speak to how creative God can be with this inner beauty. Before we move on, I'll just read an insight that my Bible has written for the Genesis 1:27 passage. It reads, The words created in his own image reveal much about our essential human nature. Of all God's creatures, we alone have moral freedom and will. Only we are capable of thinking about and knowing God. Like him, we are a unity of being, body, soul, and spirit. We have reason, emotions, and creative ability. The possibilities for comparison are numerous. And in our original unfallen state, we reflected the very righteousness and immortality of God. The good news is that for those of us who have confessed Christ as our Lord and Savior, one day you will be fully restored to that original state and restored to the point where you yourself can actually see it with your own eyes. The Bible assures us of this. Now that passage mentions a key word, and that is the term that will sometimes put a bit of a dampener on things, and that is unfallen state. Unfortunately, mankind fell, 
and sin entered the world. Does that mean, though, that this inner beauty stopped when that happened? Did it disappear? Thankfully, the answer is no. God saved it through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. And here's the proof. Romans 8.29, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And in Colossians 3.10, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Paul was referring to the new self versus the old self. And then in James 3.9, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings, who have been made in God's likeness. So we know that when God sees us, he is able to see us in the image of himself. That statement alone can do wonders for your self-esteem. But I also mentioned the sin problem that came about since humanity entered a fallen state. So what does that mean for our inner beauty? Well, with the death and resurrection of Jesus, God created the ability for us to become new creations. Because of the resurrection of Christ, you are a new creation. Do not for a moment think that God does not see that when he looks at you. But let's add on to this because it doesn't stop there. That's the amazing part. There's even more to it. I could actually go on and on about the things that are in your inner beauty. But I also have to keep this at a reasonable time. So uh, we'll just look at one more. The Bible makes it pretty clear that holiness is something that God takes seriously. And that is also something that God sees when he looks at us. Now, you may be wondering how that works if you don't live in a particularly holy lifestyle. If you've read the Old Testament, you'll know that God had a huge demand for personal holiness, and everyone had to put in a colossal amount of effort to keep his decrees. The unfortunate reality, though, is that we just simply couldn't hold up. And the same is still true today. That being said, you might then be shocked to hear me say that your inner beauty is holy. If this surprises you, given whatever your current life situation is, have no fear. It shocked me first when I first read this in the book Free to Live by John Eldridge. Now, when I say you are holy, I'm not saying that the life we live is holy. I'm saying your inner beauty is holy. Outwardly, it could be a different story at times. If you got a traffic ticket on your way to church this morning, I'm not really sure if we can claim that we're being completely holy on the outside. Unless you were in a rush to hear the morning message, then all is forgiven. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Please drive safe. Christ makes a huge call in the New Testament to be holy, and hopefully we're all trying. But in this fallen world, even that can be a very hard battle at times, and perfect holiness is probably impossible for most, if not all of us. But God knows this, and his son Jesus has ensured that something is done about it. So let's read into this. Let's look to Romans 7, verses 21 to 25. And they read, written by Paul, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work with my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sounds like a rather depressing life. We all agree? You want to be holy, you want to live a holy life, but it just doesn't happen 100% of the time. Yet I've said that you are holy. So how does that work? Remember, God looks inside. He sees your inner beauty. Again, you are made in his image and likeness. It's because this world has fallen that we're not acting like it. But you're created by a holy God, therefore he wants you to be holy, and he has made your inner beauty holy through his son Jesus. Here's the scriptures that tell us. Colossians 1.21 Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you 
by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. And Colossians 3.12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then Hebrews 3.10, And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You are holy. It may not feel like it, especially if you've committed an unholy act, which we're all guilty of at some point in life. But God knows just what we can and can't do. And Jesus makes a huge call to personal holiness in the New Testament, but at times it is so hard for us to perfectly fulfill that. And despite that, there's really no way we could ever hope to fulfill the complete holiness due to a perfect holy God. But that's just not the end. Paul feels he's at the end of his rope in Romans 7, but God has made him holy through Jesus, and that same thing is true for your inner beauty because of what he did for us on the cross. Now, just a quick side note, because I've also seen this discussion go uh, the wrong way at times. Just because God has made you holy in his sight through your inner beauty doesn't mean you should give up trying. I've seen people before where they hear this and suddenly think, oh, God has forgiven me and made me holy through his grace, so then I can just go out there in life and just do whatever I want to, sinful or not, and everything will be just fine. That is not how it works. Inner beauty is holy. Outer beauty can be a work in progress, but for the love of everything sacred, that does not mean to just forget about the whole call to holiness. Case in point, Suppose you've just committed a sin, and in the process of that sin, you broke your arm. The good news is that you are forgiven by God's grace, and that God has made you holy again through Jesus. However, you still have to live with the broken arm for a while. It will eventually heal, but you've just bought yourself a six-week healing stint. Holiness can work the same way. It's sort of there as a saving grace for when you do fail, But please, don't quit trying. I personally find it really hard to enjoy my relationship with Christ to its full potential when I'm not striving for holiness. And if you do struggle for holiness, just ask for it. God is more than willing to guide you. He even sacrificed his own son, who was perfect and sinless, so that you don't have to pay the eternal penalty for failing at holiness. If you do struggle with this, for your own sake and relationship with Jesus, bring it before Jesus himself. Pray about it. Seek prayer from others. It's been brought to my attention you even have a tent with the words, my house will be called a house of prayer written on it. That's probably a great place to start. And I'm sure there are loving leaders here who would be more than willing to pray with you so that you can experience a life filled with your inner beauty because that is how God sees you And it can transform you from the inside out, all because of Jesus. Well, that's about all I really have for this morning. I really could go on for an extremely long time giving you other takes about all the good things that are in your inner beauty that God can see, but it might take an eternity to explain all of it because that's how endless it is. And on the subject of eternity, all of this will be fully revealed when you arrive in heaven So if you've always been curious about what it is that God sees, don't worry because one day you will see it. And it's going to be beautiful. He sees his image in you. He sees within your inner beauty his likeness. And that inner beauty with God's image is holy despite everything that has ever gone on in our lives because Jesus has made it holy, because that is how much he loves us. What I will say before we start our worship again is that if you want to be seen by God with this awesome inner beauty, but you don't know Jesus, then this is all available to you now and tomorrow and next week. We can't fully begin to experience this wonderful pleasure of inner beauty unless we have confessed our lives to Jesus. You can know all this 
and you can be made holy if you come to him. He's there waiting. And all this is waiting there with him if you come to know him and what he did for you. If you don't know Jesus, or maybe you've heard of him but don't completely know him, then pray about it. Again, that house of prayer would probably be an awesome place to start. And there are people here who would love to pray with you and accept you into the wonderful family of Christ. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all of this, for everything that you have done. We thank you for going to the cross and paying the penalty for our sin so that we don't have to pay that penalty ourselves. And there's nothing that we did, Lord, to deserve this. There's nothing that we did to earn it. And there is more than certainly no way we could ever even have the hope of repaying you for it. But you went to the cross and took on that sacrifice out of your perfect grace. And for that, Lord, we will be eternally thankful. I just pray, Lord, that you help us all to see our inner beauty, to know that when you look at us, you don't see what we see when we look in the mirror. You see us as something much more wonderful and beautiful than that. We thank you, Lord, that you made us in your image, that you made us in your likeness, and we thank you, Lord, that you made us holy through what Jesus did on the cross. And I just pray, Lord, that you remind us of that every single day when we wake up and help us to remember that every single day that we live. And I just pray that when we arrive in heaven, on whenever that day is, that you reveal to us the very true nature and beauty of what it is that you see when you look at us, God. In Jesus' name, amen.